Ephesians. So we started a new sermon series on Ephesians a few weeks ago, and in between there, I was away one Sunday, uh, we had a communion in between, so it's been a few weeks, but we want to resume today on our sermon series in Ephesians. So when I started this, inter- uh, this series, when I introduced it, I introduced it by showing us, introducing us to the author, to this man named Paul, and how this man, Paul, he was a remarkable man with a remarkable story, and with a remarkable past, a past, a murderous past, nonetheless, uh, that we would never have imagined that this would be the kind of man that God would have a special calling for, and that God would use him in such a tremendous way, but God did. And that was the author of this letter to the Ephesians. The audience that Paul wrote this to, this was to uh, a mixed audience of Jews and Gentiles. They were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were followers of Jesus uh, living in the city of Ephesus. And and the city of Ephesus was kind of a metropolitan. It was a booming place. Uh, There was a huge mix of ethnicities and cultures. And as a rule of thumb, Uh, This city was hostile towards Christianity. Christianity was not just an accepted thing in this city. I think it, and I said this in the introduction, it reminds me a lot of like New York City or Vancouver or maybe Toronto or something like that. A booming place, a mixed pot of ethnicities, but where Christianity was not necessarily accepted. There was hostility towards it. So Paul wrote this letter to encourage those Christians about how rich they truly are in Christ, and how in that and because of that, they can live out their faith vibrantly, irregardless of what their context is or their circumstances are. So that was the introduction. So today we want to look at verses 3 through 14. These 12 verses are just so absolutely loaded with goodness. There's so much depth in blessing, in goodness, in what the Apostle Paul wrote here for us, it's hard to even imagine how in the world I can preach just one sermon on it. And the reality is I maybe won't. Depends how time goes today. Uh, I have a habit of not sticking to my notes lately, so I may have to cut it off in the middle and resume it next Sunday. Uh, So I'm not sure if we'll get through this whole thing today. But it's so rich. There's so many blessings here. But very often when we read this this passage, we see words like chosen, elect, predestination. And immediately, for those who have kind of grown up in the church or are somewhat familiar with theology, we recognize immediately that these are kind of loaded words. Uh, And so the temptation can be just to focus on those words in this passage and actually miss completely the whole point of why Paul is writing what he's writing. Uh, And so hopefully we don't miss that point here this morning. So as we're heading into these verses, I want to ask you, how are you doing? What's been going on in your life? Have you been rejoicing? Have you been thankful? Has life been good? Has it been a struggle? How easy has it been for you lately to give thanks? To have an attitude of thankfulness. To say thank you to God, to recognize the good things that God has done for you, that he's done in your life. And just in general, to have an attitude of gratefulness and thankfulness. And if we're honest, very often, uh, and Willie talked about this morning in Sunday school, it's so easy to get so wrapped up in our own little worlds. This is what's going on in Abe's world. These are the things happening in my life. Other people don't see it, but I see it. Uh, And there's struggles, and there's temptations, and there's anxieties, and there's stresses. And it's so easy to get so wrapped up in our own little bubbles that we forget or that we lose perspective of the bigger picture of what God is doing. And in those uh, circumstances, we lose perspective to the point often where we don't even know or aren't even sure if we have anything to be thankful for. And that's just part of life. We, we go through seasons and we struggle with some of that. Do you remember in the introduction, I introduced you to a woman named uh, Hetty Green. And I pointed out how this woman from New York, uh, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, she was a filthy rich woman 
who had millions of dollars a hundred year over a hundred years ago, and when she died, she died just filthy, filthy rich. But in her lifetime, while she lived, she lived as though she was a pauper, as though she was poor and had nothing. That's how she lived. And so I remind us of that is because as Christians, do we sometimes forget all the riches in Christ that God has given us and that we live in spiritual poverty when we don't need to? So I hope that you will be reminded of this morning of how rich we are in Christ and that you will burst forth in worship, and rejoicing, and praising God, simply because of what God has done in your life. That's my hope and my goal this morning. So let's begin. Verse 3, the first part. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul starts the section off with a verse that he makes it clear what his intentions are here, and his intentions are to spend some time in praise and worship for the blessings of God. Some other translations, it says, some other translations say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessing God and praising him was at the core of Jewish worship. In fact, uh, one of the primary ways that Jews worshipped when they worshipped together, maybe it was individually or corporately, uh, it could be both, One of the primary ways they did this was recalling all the ways that God had blessed them. And I think that's part of the reason why we have such powerful psalms written for us in the Bible. Because many of the psalms are expressions of recalling all the ways God blessed them. And so, and that's the intention that Paul has here to show us that to part of worshiping God and praising him and blessing him is recalling the blessings that we have in Christ. And that is what starts off this 12-verse long section. And here's an interesting thing to give you some context that I feel is quite important to understanding these 12 verses. These 12 verses in their original Greek are one long sentence. Paul, when he wrote this, from verses 3 all the way to the end of verse 14, was one sentence. If we break this down here, I think we have like probably 20 sentences here. Did you know in the original writings, there were not chapter breaks and verse breaks? These chapters and verses were added by translators on for, later on for ease of reading, memorization, different reasons. But this was one lengthy chunk. It was one sentence. So why is that important to know for us? Let me read to you uh, something that commentator Thomas Yoder Neufeld says about this, in regard to this. He says this. He says, These verses are not easy to read in the original Greek. Lengthy, cumbersome phrases weighed down with chains of synonyms and nouns qualified by overloaded adjectives are fused into one long sentence that carries the immense freight of most of the great themes of this letter. Translators as well as the editors of the Greek text, have broken the difficult sentence into several shorter sentences so that we don't get lost in the maze. A price is paid for this ease of reading, however. We lose the experience of reading or hearing the passage as one long, unbroken, deliberately exhausting recitation of how God has blessed us. The sentence breaks, they rob us of the experience of running out of breath as we bless God. They rob us of running out of breath as we praise God. So, did the Apostle Paul not know grammar? Was that why he did it in one sentence? That's not the case. He was an intelligent man. He was just an awesome writer. But he very intentionally wrote this in one long sentence. It was a letter to church to a church meant to be passed on to other churches for the purpose of when they would read this section, it was meant to be read in one long sentence so that they would get exhausted and run out of breath just recalling all the ways that God has blessed us. Let that sink in a little bit. 
Does anybody volunteer to stand up and read this whole section in one breath or try? It would be pretty difficult, right? And we know that we can't, but the, the, that's the intention. And I think it's uh, important for us to realize that. That as the church was reading this section, they would run out of breath in trying to recall all the ways that God has blessed us. And then, at the end of verse 3 and going forward, Paul begins to list and to say what some of these blessings are. So the second part of verse 3 says, Who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Has God blessed us? And if he has, is it just in the heavenly realms somewhere? And what does that even mean? Does that, the heavenly realms, does that just mean in the future somewhere? Well, Paul says, who has blessed us. Something that has already happened. So we maybe don't fully understand what he all means by heavenly realms, but he definitely does not mean that it's just off in the future somewhere. He's saying that Christ has blessed us, and those blessings, uh, they have an effect on us, both for now and for the future. And these blessings, and he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And instead of me elaborating on that, as we go on in the passage, I think Paul does the elaborating for us. Verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Paul says we were chosen before the creation of the world. Before the foundation of the world was ever laid, God already chose humanity. How many of us like being chosen? Anyone? I do. Anyone like being rejected? We all like to be chosen. I don't know how this is how, for how many of you this is true, but for me, when I hear this, I think of my school days, elementary and high school. And some of you maybe had similar experiences. You're in gym class, and the gym teacher says, okay, today we're going to play rugby or soccer. And we're going to take the whole class, put you in one pile, but I'm going to pick two coaches. Uh, and these two coaches are going to pick team members, and they're just going to take turns picking people out of the whole class to be on their team. How many of you have experienced this? Okay, how many of you... When you experienced that, were the last one to be picked. How did it feel to be the last one to be picked? And why does it feel bad? Because the coach is looking, and they maybe know everybody a little bit, some of your abilities and strengths, and they're choosing, let's be honest, they're choosing based on what they see, on your strengths and weaknesses. And if you get chosen last, chances are you're known to be the, the suckiest rugby player in the whole class. It's a possibility. And maybe that's why he got chosen last. And so it doesn't feel great. But that's not what God is saying here. What Paul is saying. He says here, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Okay, let's remember, we can get easy carried away, but what does this exactly mean? What does choosing exactly mean? And of course, we need to get into that a little bit more. But let's not forget that Paul is reciting blessings that we have received already in Christ. So Paul isn't intentionally diving into a theological debate. He is showing us the blessings that we have already received. In Christ, he chose us in him before the creation of the world. And he says, to be holy and blameless in his sight. So before God ever laid the foundations, before he created what we see with our eyes, God made a decision that he wanted humans to be part of his story. Let's go on. There's more we're going to say about this, but let's go on for now. Verses at the end of verse 4 and verse 5. In love... He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of his will. So through Jesus, we are predestined for adoption into God's family. And Paul says, because of love. Because of love, through Jesus, we are predestined 
for adoption. Okay, now this is where it can get a little bit messy and tricky, and I have to admit, I don't fully grasp or understand, and I definitely don't have all the answers. But here's what it seems to me that Paul is saying. Okay, ask yourself this question. In verse 4, he says, God chose us before the foundation of the world. Here he says he predestined us to sonship. Okay, so the first one, God choosing. Did God choose Adam and Eve? Yes or no? Do we think God chose Adam and Eve? It sure seems like it. He created them. They weren't even born as a result of something immoral, and they just happened to come into the world. God literally made them. So it seems like the most obvious illustration of God choosing someone, right? So God chose Adam and Eve. So God chose humanity. So were Adam and Eve predestined and elected? I think we would say they were. But God says, Paul said there in verse 4, that before the foundations of the world, he chose us. This was before sin entered. God in his wisdom knew sin was going to come, but he chose Adam and Eve. And after that, sin enters the whole picture and it gets messy. But now, in verse 5, here's what I'm getting at. He predestined us for adoption to sonship. Why would God need to predestine someone for adoption? Okay, what is adoption? Adoption is when somebody doesn't have a family or parents, and some other loving family takes them in and says, okay, you are now my children. Okay, were Adam and Eve God's children? Did God choose them? I think we would say yes. So did Adam and Eve need to be adopted? I don't think Adam and Eve needed to be adopted. Why not? Because they were already children. So where am I going with this? That was pre-sin. Sin enters the picture, messes everything up, but God, in his wisdom, and not just in his wisdom, Paul says, because of love. Why did God choose humanity to begin with, that he would create humans before he ever laid the foundations of the world? Because he was inviting us to be part of his story and to experience love, to experience relationship. So he chose us before sin even entered. He, didn't, he wasn't that coach on the team looking at, hmm, who are the good people? Who are going to be good players on my team? That's not what he did. He chose humanity before the foundation of the world. Okay, but sin enters, and now Paul says, and Paul doesn't explain it the way I do, so some of these are my words, obviously, but this is how I understand it. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. Why? Because sin came on the scene. Because Humanity said, Dad, I don't like your plan. Dad, I don't want to be your son. I want to do things my way. I'm going to go, and I'm going to do what I feel like doing. But what does God do in love? God's choice to choose humanity, his sovereign choice, doesn't get derailed just because of our sinfulness. In love, God made a way for us to be brought back, to be adopted into sonship. But the end of the verse 5 says, in accordance with his pleasure and will. So in love and according to his pleasure and his will. What does this tell us about the character of God? That his pleasure and will is to have a relationship with us. It could have been perfect if sin would have never entered. We would have been... His children, we would have been holy and blameless what we were called to if we would have just followed his instructions and believed him and said, Dad, you're right, I'm going to do things your way. We would have been a set-apart humanity because we're different than animals, different than, than the planets, set apart for a specific thing. But we said no, we went our own way. But through Christ, he again, because of his pleasure, his will doesn't get overturned or derailed Because of our humanness. God provides a way back. Going on. Verse 6. Sorry, before I get to verse 6, I want to comment a few other things here uh, based again on uh, the commentator Neufeld. In regard to this whole thing of choosing and predetermining, predestination, predestination, 
Yoder makes a few observations that I think are so good, I want to repeat what he says here. He says this. He says, first, it is God who has chosen us. This cannot be emphasized enough, that it is God who has chosen us. God is the benevolent parent who chooses first. So remember, we're talking here in the context of worship. Paul says, let's bless God because of all the ways he blessed us. In the context of worship, in that context, God is the benevolent parent who chooses us first. Worship and, and praise, the way Paul says, is a response to God's first act. God made the first move. The next observation that uh, Newfelt makes, he says this. He says, the phrase before the foundation of the cosmos serves to emphasize that it is God who has chosen us, not that we chose God. The cho- that choice rests in the wisdom of God that predates creation. Temporary language is here employed to make the point that God's choice is not a response to humanity's predicament, not to mention their behavior. Instead, it is an initiative that underlies the creation of humanity to begin with. God is not a chess player who makes his next move only after he has seen the last move of his opponent. He works to a plan. The fact that this pre-creation choice is made in Christ also means that God's blessing of humanity in Christ goes beyond the cross and resurrection as important as they are. I think this is an important observation to make here. The cross and the resurrection are absolutely crucial and important to our coming back and being adopted into sonship, whether it's in the Old Testament where it's looking ahead towards the cross, or whether it's here with us now, we're looking back. That was always part of it, and as important as that is, but what Neufeld is pointing out here, it's not just because of the cross and resurrection that God chose us. He chose us before the foundation of the world in Christ because he desired to have relationship with humanity. And when we messed it up, he initiated the next part of his plan to give us a way back. Now, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. God has freely given us his grace, and grace is undeserved favor, merit, or a gift. So we need to ask ourselves, who gets the credit for this grace? He does. It says, to the praise of his glorious grace. We can't take credit again for his grace. God gives it to us. This grace is freely given in the one he loves. I think this is an important observation to make here again. God gives his grace, but is his grace based on those who will one day obey him? Some kind of individual election and predestination that his grace is for those who might one day? That's not what it says here. It says it's, for, it's uh, in the one that he loves. It's all based on Jesus. Although God's choice to choose us and to create humanity and welcome us to share in his wonderful love predates creation and is not based on our response to him and our hu- human predicament of sin, yet in spite of our response, his sovereign choice is not undermined, or wasted. And that's the point we need to understand here. God's choice is not undermined, and it's not wasted. John 3.16 fits in here to me so perfect. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God's choice wasn't wasted. Because of his love, in response to our rebellion, his love is directed at Jesus. And in Jesus, we have the way back. In Christ, everyone is chosen. God cho- chose undiscriminately to bring humanity into the picture because he desires to share with humanity what he has with the Trinity. And he makes a way back for us. Verse 7 and 8. 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. So this is where some of the rubber hits the road. In Christ we have redemption. He says here to buy back, you know, sorry, we have redemption, and redemption means to buy something back. We've been bought back through the blood of Christ. In other words, Christ gave his life to buy us back. Another definition of redeeming or buying us back is a releasing affected by payment of ransom. A releasing affected by payment of ransom. So we were kidnapped or enslaved by sin, or we are. But Christ ransoms us. He pays the ransom. He buys us back. This redemption and buying back also provides forgiveness for our sins. Is there anybody here this morning that does not desire to be forgiven when you sin? Or for all your past sins? We all desire forgiveness. This is an amazing thing. And because of his riches, the riches of God's grace, which points to the fact, it, that very thing points to the fact that we did not deserve it. But yet, he gave it anyway. Grace means getting a blessing or a gift which we did not deserve. Paul says in Romans 8, 5 verse 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this is not about us deserving it. It's about God's grace. It says here, through his blood. So for people who grew up in church, when we say through the blood of Jesus or we sing about the blood of Jesus, we often don't think anything of it. But have you ever stopped to think that for somebody who didn't grow up in church, who didn't grow up hearing preaching, that it's actually a gory thing? Like, really? I'm going to church and they're telling me that by somebody's blood I'm saved? Like, that's gross. How does that even work? We need to understand that blood represents life. Every one of you has blood pumping through your veins. Without blood in your body, you'd be dead. Blood equals life. And what this is pointing to is that Jesus gave his life for you and for me. He paid the ransom. He bought us back for God's purposes. And this is all possible, Paul says, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Think about the word lavished. You know what this word means? The word lavished here, it means to spend abundantly or even to spend foolishly. God spent everything on us. If you stop and think about everything we've said here this morning, I guess to be honest, what I've said, hopefully you've been listening. When God decided in his heart before the foundation of the world, that he's going to create humans. And then he created, but he created this whole universe that we see. He created this earth that we see with our eyes. And why did he do it? He did it to give us humans a place to enjoy, a place that's sustainable, that feeds us, where we can fellowship and where we can relate, where we can live, where we can see the beauty of God creation. God spent a lot on us. But here's the thing, it wasn't enough. So what did we do? We said, God, it looks great. Sure, it's kind of cool, but I don't like your plan. I want to go my way. And we said it wasn't enough. And what does God do? He goes back to his bank account and he spends even more. He gives his only son. How many of us, and not only that, we, he gave his son... Like that verse I said in Romans 5, verse 8, while we were yet sinners, we made ourselves enemies with God. So ask yourself this question. How many of you would, first of all, spend a dime for an enemy? For somebody that you consider, maybe not exactly an enemy, but somebody you sure don't like, and they sure don't like you. And maybe they've even offended you or hurt you in the past. How much would you spend for that person? How much would you go out of your way to sacrifice for that person who does not like you? Now forget about spending. Now think about giving your child as a sacrifice for that enemy. Would you do it? This is what God did. And this gives us a picture 
of this lavish spending, this lavish grace that he has for us. It's out of this world. It's hard to even comprehend who would do something like that for their enemy. Verses 8 through 10. So this section here, with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and under earth. In these two verses here, and part of the last part of verse 8, it seems that we actually see the vision and purpose for all these blessings that we've received in Christ. And also, we get a hint here of the backbone to his letter, of what he's getting at here. He said, he made known to us the mystery of what? The mystery of his will. Well, in the word mystery here, we have to admit some of this is mysterious. There is an aspect of mystery that we don't fully understand God's sovereignty. I don't fully understand what exactly, practically speaking, it all means that God chose and elected and predestined. There is an aspect of mystery. But he says here that he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. It was not a mistake. God did this in wisdom and understanding. So what was the purpose of God's will? It was Jesus in Christ. In Christ, God, according to his good pleasure, he did what? What was his will that we see here? He says to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth. So we see a picture here of restoration again. Sin messed everything up. It broke the unity that humans had with God, and the unity that humans have with each other. All we need to do is ask ourselves, is there war going on in the world and hate, or does everybody love each other and get along great? Well, we know the answer to that. But the purpose of this is for all things to be brought into unity under Christ. And Paul recognizes that much of this happens, it says, when times reach their fulfillment. The ultimate unifying of all things will be when times reach their fulfillment. And maybe that means when Jesus comes back. I think it does. But we experience a part of this now as relationships are restored. Primarily our relationship with God, but also the ability for our relationships with one another to be restored. Scripture paints a picture for us that before Christ returns a second time to judge all people and to make everything new, this world will get worse before it gets better. Better. Until then, we can already experience this unity because he has blessed us. Already through Christ so that we can be one with the Father and we can work towards oneness with each other. Because, and what this means practically, is that when God forgives us our sins, we when we recognize that and accept it, all of a sudden we can begin forgiving each other. And that forgiveness is what brings the healing process of restoration and human relationships as well. It's a beautiful thing. Verse 11. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the pleasure of his will. Again, he talks here that we were chosen. But it says here, we need to ask ourselves, how were we chosen? It says, in him. The ESV says, in him we have obtained an inheritance. So who receives an inheritance? Children do. Heirs do. And through the adoption to sonship, we receive an inheritance. But this is a generic term. This is not talking just literally about male sons. This is talking about children, including daughters. So, and we are predestined for what? It says we have been predestined according to his plan. And what was his plan? Going back to verse 10, uh, his plan was for us to be united. And also going back to verse 5, for adoption to sonship. So when we look at all these verses again, we need to ask ourselves, who is the chosen one? Who is the elect? Who is the predestined? Is it us or is it Christ? Christ is the chosen one. Christ is the one that was predestined. 
He is the elect. In Christ, we are predestined according to the conformity and purpose of his will. And what was that will? To bring all things to unity. Our election is based in God's love in Christ and our way back when sin entered is again in Christ. It's all based on God's election and good pleasure and will in Christ. And another thing we need to realize here when talking about this subject of predestination and election and choice, the language here is use or y'all. It's not you. It's not Neil, I'm cho- I chose you. Paul is talking to a church. He's saying y'all are chosen in Christ. Now, does that mean that God doesn't have specifically you in mind? Yes, that's part of it when we come to faith, but this is talking about y'all. And the next few verses, it, they show us that. Verse 12, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Who were the first? He says, Paul says, we who were the first. Who are the first? The Jews. God chose in the old covenant, he chose one nation to be his representatives through whom he would bless the whole world. Is what he says there. So through the Jews, they were the first ones to put their hope in Christ, or they sure should have anyway. But he says here, for the praise, that it might be for the praise of his glory. So another thing we see in this verse is that for those who put their hope in Christ is for the praise of God. God is creating a worshiping community. One who experiences blessings from God, but also who God blesses. And we are called to respond in worship. God is creating a worshiping community. Verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of of your salvation, when you believed. You were marked in him with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Okay, you also. The previous verse, he says, in order that we who first put our hope. Now the next verse, he says, and you also. Who is the you also? So before it was me and Willie, we, you know, me and Willie, we're somehow more spiritual than everybody else. We got it figured out. We were called. But through Jesus, now even somebody as, I won't say it, as bad as whoever, you also. He's talking about Gentiles, that through the Jews, God sent the Messiah through that descendants, their descendants through that lineage, And through all of that, all of us, you Gentiles also, can be part of this. We can be included. And how? He says here, when you believe this message of salvation. So you need to ask yourself, have you heard the message of truth? Have you heard this gospel of salvation? If you haven't before this morning, you have now. Not because a Berg has some words for you. But because of the word of God, it's right here. This is the gospel. This is the message of truth. The gospel of your salvation is what Paul says here. And he says, when you believed, when you respond to this message in faith, you are included. You were marked. Why else would you be marked with a seal if you're not included? If you don't become part of the elect. And this believing leads to action. This is not talking about some mental consent. Oh, yeah, it sounds good. Okay, yep, I agree. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about an, a belief that leads to action. When a doctor gives you instructions and you believe him, the action is then that you follow his instructions. When you believe that a bridge is safe to cross, you don't just say it and then take a detour the other way. You cross that bridge. It leads to action. So why does he give us the seal of the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do? Verse 14. Who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee that what God has promised us will receive until times reach their fulfillment and our blessings 
will be fully realized. So we already have been blessed, but we, Paul recognizes and we are given the Holy Spirit, who, by the way, is God's Spirit. That's who this Holy Spirit is, deposited into us when we believe, and it's a seal marking us for the fulfillment of all those promises. And we can look forward to that day. So what difference does all of this make? We need to stop and ask ourselves, do we recognize how rich we are? Do we see it? Do we have eyes to see? Do we have reason to burst forth in praise and thanksgiving in recognition, recognition of all the ways that God has blessed us? Now, I know we're not a charismatic church, but now would be the time for you to say, Hallelujah, Amen, praise the Lord. Okay? I'm serious. When we recognize how blessed we are, and no matter where you are on your journey, your hardships, your struggles, your darkness, in Christ, we are blessed beyond measure. We should run out of breath trying to recount all the ways that we are blessed. But here's the thing. Even in this, there is a good news aspect in this very thing that I'm trying to say. You know what that good news is? We don't have to conjure up or fake or make up a list of things that we're thankful for, that we can rejoice and praise God over. You know why? Because if we have put our faith, if we have believed, as Paul says here in verse 13, and we are part of that salvation and we're in Christ, that means that everything that we've just read, all the blessings that Paul has said, they're true of you. You don't need to make anything up. You don't have to pretend. This is true of us. That's amazing, isn't it? We are chosen before the foundation of the world, even though God knew how stupid you were going to be. God chose us. He predestined us to adoption for sonship, that we can be his children, that we're not orphans running around without parents who don't care. God cares. He chose us. We are so incredibly blessed. And our response, the only appropriate response, is worship. And that is the point that Paul is making here. He's not trying to just make a divisive theological discussion here, which has become so divisive among Christians and theologians. He is showing us that God, yes, he's in control. He always has been. And so even though language isn't specifically you, Dave, or specifically you, Andrea, but we're included in that. Are we human or are we not? We are created in the image of God, and we have a purpose. If God did all that, if he spent so much, drained his bank account, and the wealthiest person on the face of the earth, and this analogy breaks down because he's not human like us, but if he did all that, do you really think he doesn't have a plan for you? When you feel discouraged, when you're in a season where you have struggled, in a season of darkness and you can't see the light, and you're not sure what to be thankful for, rest assured God has a plan. He has a purpose for all of us in Christ. And he thought of us. He thought of all of us. Let me close with this analogy. And I've said this before. Analogies always break down. They're very limited. So in spite of all its limitations, this is a little bit how I think of this whole thing. So think of a baseball team. I know Randy would love it if I talked about football. Sorry, I'm just not a football guy. Think of a baseball team. God said, before baseball existed, I'm going to create a baseball team. And then he does. And boy, what a team it is. They're not like the Blue Jays. They actually win. But then the team says, you know what? We don't like our coach. We don't like his ideas, his game strategy. Even though it seems to be working perfect, there's nothing wrong with it. But nah, we think he's hiding something from us. We're going to go our own way. And all those players get kicked off the team, so to speak. But then... God makes a way for those players to come back. Those players 
were still created in his image. There's still somebody that he had in mind to be a baseball player. But here's the thing. They were chosen for that. But if they never put, if they never believe it, if they never put on the team jersey, and they never go and play baseball, in the end, when the season is over and the Blue Jays win the World Series, those people who never showed up for the games, never put on the jersey and never played, will they be even recognized as players? They won't be. But it's not that they couldn't have been. They didn't accept what God had for them. This is the picture I have of predestination and choosing. God chose all of us. And through Jesus, he's inviting us back to put the jersey on and to be part of the team. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your glorious grace. Thank you, Father, for your lavish spending, for your love for us. Father, we know that we did not deserve it. And Father, there may be some here this morning, right now, who have been listening and who recognize that these blessings that we're talking about and reading here in Ephesians, they don't identify with them. And they're wondering, why is this not true of me? And so, Father, for those who are here this morning who are thinking that and feeling that, I pray they would not be in despair. I pray that their eyes would be open and they would see that you had them in mind when you invited humanity and created humanity to be part of your story and also when you sent Jesus and you predestined us to sonship, that they are also predestined to be your son or daughter. And I pray that they would respond in faith and receive you right this moment. Father, thank you for all the ways that you have blessed us. Thank you, Father. We just praise you and give you glory. We just worship you and we know that we're not worthy. But you say that we are blessed. You say who we are. May we believe who you say that we are and not the lies that we tell ourselves of who we think we are. Father, we love you. We thank you for lavishing your love on us. In Jesus' name, amen.